I screwed up again. So this is the kind of video I would rather never do, but in the last week video I made a couple of errors. I want to be clear, all were due to me failing of properly checking the sources, nobody else was involved. In one case I used the wrong picture, but there is worse, I gave a wrong depiction of Russia's semiconductor production and so I need to correct myself. <laughs> So while talking about how Montenegro, a small state on the Adriatic coast, is home to many Russian expats, I use this picture. Sorry, this is not related to Montenegro, this is actually the National Library in Pristina, in the nearby but completely distinct Kosovo. This was due to me trusting Google's algorithm too much. To apologize, here are a few views of Montenegro thanks to the official website of Montenegro National Tourism Organization. In the previous video I said that the Russian semiconductor industry is capable of at most a 350 nanometer process. This is not correct, I trusted a source that turned out to be biased. Uh, now I'm not a Asianometry and I'm probably not qualified to tell the history of Soviet and Russian semiconductors, but I will try my best to give you a more correct and up-to-date picture. The Russian Silicon Valley is Zhidinograd, a town 10 km northwest of Sheremetyevo Airport, one of the Moscow international airports. In the 60s, during the Khrushchev administration, the, the place was designed as the core of the Soviet effort to catch up with the US in the industry of integrated circuits and electronics in general. Actually, in the Soviet Union there was the know-how and a lot of scientific experimentation was happening, but the government choice was different, it was to focus on catching up with the US and try replicating Western designs with some European help sometimes. Obviously there was a lot of espionage going on as Yelinograd was one of those close cities that existed in the old Soviet Union. In the 80s the US intelligence estimates were that the Soviet Union was about 5 to 10 years behind, which was well a reasonable outcome with this kind of policy. Then the dissolution of the Soviet Union happened, the last decade of the 90s happened, and most of the ground gained was lost. Now Zelenograd is no longer a closed city, but it is still the home of most of the Russian semiconductor industry. The two main companies today working on semiconductors in Russia are Micron Group and Angstrom, both based in Zelenograd. Micron is the largest of the two and it has at least two factories, which are called fabs in this industry, in Zelenograd. In the Micron catalog there are several various types of integrated circuits and they seem to keep developing new products. For example, they recently launched a line of microcontrollers for the automotive industry. Micron is also the house of the Elbrus processor, an indigenous microprocessor developed in Russia capable of emulating the x86 architecture. The Elbrus 2 is a dual core and it is produced in Russia, while the Elbrus 4S is a four cores and it was produced in Taiwan by TSMC. Uh, this processor is now quite old, it's basically obsolete. The first version goes back to 2011 and the 4S goes back to 2014. The clock is 300 MHz for the 2S and 800 MHz for the 4S. This is a typical case that is showing the lag of the Russian semiconductor industry. When it comes to these more complex and higher and integrated circuits, they are 10 or 2, 15 years late and I'm probably generous. A case like the Elbrus does not have a direct impact on weapons production, but it has an impact on the processing power available to the country in general. As I was saying in the last video, it is in principle possible to compensate with smarter architecture and more chips, but the miniaturization goes out of the window and power requisites change and not for the better. 
However, Micron today is producing with 180, 90, and 65 nanometers nodes. That is much more modern processes than those I mentioned in, in the video. However, the wafer size is still 200 millimeters, which is the old industry standard, while the current is 300 millimeters. The Micron group has also a large production of analog chips with the old 900 nanometers node, which represents the low end of the market. And well, okay, it's not glamorous, but it is needed by the market anyway. Angstrom, the second producer, actually filed for bankruptcy in 2018, but a visit on their website is actually a very interesting experience. It seems that they are still alive and kicking. They produce a large variety of integrated circuits, logic controllers and simple FPGAs, for example. Uh, they also produce a microprocessor for space applications. I also noticed that they produce quite a lot of analog circuits, including operational amplifiers. And some of you will know that I am an audiophile and some of the Angstrom op-amps should be compatible with the op-amps found in those small desktop amplifiers. And now I keep wondering how they are going to sound if I use in one of those. However, Angstrom produces the 1200 and 600 nanometers node, albeit it seems that it has some capability in the 250 nanometers node. But the wafer sizes are even older, being 100 and 150 millimeters. Uh, sorry, I just realized that some of you may not know what these numbers mean. So, the node measured in nanometer is a characteristic dimension of the electronic component built into the chip. The smaller, the better, because you can pack more components and do more stuff more quickly with less energy in a smaller package. The wafer size measures the size of production lot, so to speak. Typically, integrated circuits are printed with a process called lithography on a plate of pure silicon called the wafer, depositing layers of various impurities that build the components on the surface of the wafer. The wafer is usually round and the larger the wafer diameter, the better, because you can fit more components on the same wafer. After the circuits are printed, the wafer is cut and packaged in the typical blackish boxes you see if you open everything any sort of electronics today. It is also worth to know that the process is not perfect and the chips may have an intrinsic quality. Um, sometimes it's called the silicon lottery. Some lesser quality chips may not be reliable for some use cases. For example, very cheap Chinese phones may contain second choice silicon, making them a good investment only on paper. This is the problem mentioned in the leak about the Chinese replacement chips in the helicopter industry that I mentioned in the previous video. Going back to Russian semiconductors, there is also a handful of bouquet manufacturers that can produce around 150 or below nanometers. Or on the flip side, other producers that can mass produce but at very old nodes, 500 nanometers and above. Part of this production is specialized, for example, in space applications, which can be very demanding for the electronics. Overall, as we said in the other video, the Russian production covers about 25% of the Russian demand, so they can is not self-sufficient, neither in quantity nor in quality. However, as you have seen, the situation is not nearly as bad as outlined in the previous video, so apologies. One thing was correct though, that is, the Russian government is very serious about achieving self-sufficiency and reducing the gap. There is a large investment to acquire the technology for a 28 nanometer node, but that's not everything because the key technology for the node achievement is the lithography machines. For the smallest nodes, there is basically a single producer in the world, the Dutch-American ASML. While China is trying so far with limited success to replicate this technology, Russia is investing in an entirely new type of process from scratch. This is going to be painful, but it is probably the right thing to do if you want to achieve self-sufficiency. What is this new process? Well, I leave the explanation to the professional when we will have more news. I stop here. So, thank you very much for watching this short video. Thank you very much for giving me your time and attention. I really appreciate that. I consider it this a honor and a privilege. An enormous thank you to all those who are already supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by one-off donations. 
And if you want to help the channel, please do the usual YouTube step, subscribe, hit the bell, and hit the like button. But if you really want to help me in producing content, please watch another video on the channel straight after this one. There are more than 300 videos on the channel. Some examples will appear beside me. Please feel free to click on those. So again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Thank you.